Hi everybody, I'm Dr Ella Houston. I'm a lecturer in disability studies in the School of Social Sciences and we're really fortunate today to have a guest lecturer Dr Adan Jariat-Paul. Now Adan is a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Disability Studies at Ryerson University. They are a white settler in Canada who lives with chronic pain, depression and anxiety. They study disability, disability media and popular culture. Their work has appeared in feminist media studies, autobiography studies and game studies. So without further ado, um, Adan, I'd like to welcome you today and um, you, you're welcome to begin your guest lecture. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Ella. I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so I'm actually in Kingston, uh, Ontario, Canada, which is about halfway between Toronto and Ottawa, if that means anything. Um, it's 9 a.m. here, so I'm having my morning coffee. Uh, I'm not fully awake yet, but I will be, and I'm, I'm very happy to be here talking to you today about digital intimacy, access, and disability. Um, if anyone feels comfortable, I'd love to know where you're located, uh, if you don't mind posting in the chat. Uh, I believe that all of you are in the UK. I actually studied at uh, Newcastle for a bit during my undergrad. So feel free to introduce yourself in the chat um, uh, at this point. So thank you again, Ella, for that introduction. And I think I just wanted to do um, a visual description for you. So I have blue eyes, I have short sandy hair. Um, my hair was shaved in the summer and I'm growing it out. So it looks horrible right now. So I'm wearing a nice maroon toque to hide that. And I'm also wearing like a gray sweater and I have my black headphones. Okay, so uh, I did wanna do a land acknowledgement. Uh, it's conventional in Canada to start with a land acknowledgement, to recognize the land and the people who cared for the land for generations and to draw attention to the ongoing violence of settler colonialism. So I'm talking to you today from the traditional territories of the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Kingston is also about 60 kilometers from Tyendinaga Mohawk territory. Um, Canada needs to start respecting indigenous sovereignty to dismantle the policing system that continues to perpetuate violence against black and indigenous bodies and to put in place the recommendations set out by the inquiry into the missing and murdered indigenous girls and women. Those of us living in settler states need to put pressure on our government to respect the rights and lives of indigenous peoples nations and cultures. Those of us not living in settler colonial nations can still educate ourselves and participate in combating the ongoing violence of settler colonialism around the world. Um, so just a little bit of admin for today. So during the guest lecture, please feel welcome to have your video on or off. Uh, feel welcome to stand, sit, walk around, take breaks, um, just do whatever your body needs to do. A Zoom lecture is not inherently more accessible or kinder to our bodies than an in-person lecture. So please do take care of yourselves. So I will be asking questions throughout the lecture, but I recognize that many of us don't have the energy for participation and that's absolutely fine. Uh, I do wanna make space for conversation since I think many of us are isolated right now and might wanna share our experiences and have a discussion about disability, technology, COVID, access, you know, care and things like that. Um, okay, so let's jump right in. Closed captions, voice to text software, Zoom, Instagram. Digital media and screen technology have become part of our everyday lives. They offer ways to connect, form community, practice self and collective care, and create and disseminate knowledge. However, in the turn to online spaces and platforms, in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic, the neoliberal ideology underscoring technological development has become clear. Discourses of speed, efficiency, cure and overcoming permeate conversations about media and digital devices. What if we reoriented our understanding and use of digital media around slowness, failure, glitch, rest and care? What kinds of communities and practices would emerge if we centered disability in discussions of screen technology? Uh, so this talk explores the complex relationships between disability, 
access, media, technology, and culture. Uh, my lecture merges personal experience with broader conversations, theories, and trends surrounding disability justice and feminist new media. Okay, so the first part is called pain. I have an intimate relationship with my cell phone. I know the way it feels in my hands. I know every scratch, every crack, every sound. I wake up to its alarm, the thrill of a text message, the anxiety when it's misplaced, the way it fits in my coat pocket, the time I left it in the backseat of a cab, but it came back to me, relief, wholeness. All those poems I typed out on the bus, all those nights when I was alone and it brought me to you. Uh, so I'm writing the first draft of this piece on Google Docs using speech to text, which is a bit messy and hard to get used to. I've been having tingling, numbness, and pain in my hands and feet for the last four weeks. Um, I thought I was dying, but the blood tests came back negative and the doctor at the ER told me I was fine. My doctor told me over the phone that I have anxiety. Sometimes it hurts the joints of my finger to press the keys. I think about the feedback loop between anxiety and pain and technology. The way pressing a key or a button on my phone sends an electrical signal to my spine and brain. I think about how close I am to my technology, how much I've needed it over the years when my mobility was limited and I was alone and isolated. I use Twitter and Skype and Facebook and email to connect and to find community. I played Stardew Valley on Steam and binge shows on, network, on Netflix as self-care. I remember when my fingerprints on the screen of my smartphone felt like a love letter. Technology can be a site of access intimacy to use Mia Mingus's concept. It can allow us to work, create and connect from bed. It can be a form of self or collective care. Technology can also be disabling, from carpal tunnel syndrome to back pain, blurred vision and migraines, the fatigue of another Zoom call, the anxiety of the camera. The feelings I have for my device are complicated. Resentment, desire, love, anger, driven by necessity and loneliness, boredom and stress. I haven't found the space to fully articulate what this means for me, for a culture enamored by narratives of technological progress and bodily enhancement. Where in the complex cyborg interfacing between bodies and screens, is there room for pain? Uh, so my question for you for this first section is, um, what device do you use every day? And you know, what is your relationship with that device like? Has it changed during the COVID pandemic? Has it not changed? Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about uh, your relationship with technology. Um, feel free as always, if you think of anything to type it in the chat, we'll get back to it. I know it takes some time to, to sort of think over, over our questions and discussions. So the second section is called speed slash slow. High speed internet, instant access the world at your fingertips. Connection at the press of a button. Digital media are routinely advertised as fast and efficient. They speed us up. They correct the slowness of our body minds. They help us. They fix us. They keep us connected. They keep us working even in a global pandemic and they keep us buying more. Communications companies promise a utopia of health and efficiency, of speed and access even as they erase the existence of disabled users and ignore many of the realities of using screen technology. We're currently living in a moment where these tensions are very visible. For example, um, we see institutions pushing for work to go online or courses to go online very quickly, assuming that technology is easy, fast and accessible. And we've also seen a pushback from workers uh, teachers and students because technology is very embodied. Learning new programs is very labor intensive and using these programs can be very labor intensive. There are also problems with access, whether it's needing high-speed internet or a personal computer, which not everyone have, has. 
Having a workspace at home highlights the inequalities of tech access, as well as the different living conditions we're in, right? So like who has a private office and who's zooming in from a shared computer in a crowded apartment? So what if we reoriented our understanding of technology around slowness, around glitches and failures, dropped phone calls and frozen screens? What if our scholarship was centered on slow bodies, bodies that type slowly, that read slowly, that need more time to learn the program, that need more time to rest? What if we resisted the neoliberal emphasis on speed and progress and moved towards crypt times and timelines? What if we understood the need for troubleshooting and napping, breathing and restarting? Um, so I wanna offer the idea of glitch as intimacy here and what it would mean to accept glitch, failure, and slowness into our digital spaces and communities. Uh, so recently I was listening to an episode of Sophie Hagen's podcast, Made of Human. Uh, so Sophie is a queer, fat, mentally ill feminist, and I absolutely adore their work. So they opened the episode by apologizing for the poor audio quality of the episode, explaining that they were recording on their phone while in bed. It made me think about the way that errors can be connected to intimacy, that poor audio quality or frozen screens make us feel close to someone, right? The, the ideas of like messy hair or a stain on a t-shirt or a stumbling over the pronunciation of a word. The way a broken connection can also be a break in the professional facade, in the smoothness of a lecture or a podcast, can draw attention to the materiality of media production and the body and the person involved in that production. It draws the listener into the experience of creating art, into the home and the life of the creator. Because glitches are unplanned and unintended, they can feel intimate. I need these moments of intimacy, lying in bed with Sophie Hagen, our phones pressed against our ears, our hearts beating just a little too fast. So uh, my question for the audience is, have you experienced any glitches that rather than inspiring, you know, frustration, fatigue and isolation, instead uh, made you laugh or made you smile or made you feel closer to the other person? Next section, but we can always go back uh, and bring up some of the topics as well. Um, oh, so that was actually a great segue into where we went uh, in our conversation because the next section is on space. Um, so I wanna return to a theme that's sort of throughout this talk, which is the crip spaces of knowledge production, right? Where do we make art? Where do we perform research? What are those spaces like and what is the relationship between our bodies, spaces, and the knowledge we create? Um, so in the podcast episode that I mentioned, Sophie tells us that she's in bed. Um, I've been spending a lot of time in bed too. Uh, the bed feels like a particularly noteworthy crip space. Um, for example, Joanna Hedva writes Sick Woman Theory from Bed. And Leah Lakshmi Piepsna Samrasina, who's the author of the excellent book, Care Work Dreaming Disability Justice, has a section that's entitled, you know, So Much Time Spent in Bed. What do we do in bed, right? Sleep, dream, lie awake with our thoughts, think, write, text, masturbate, have Zoom calls, have phone calls with our doctors, teach classes, create art, watch YouTube, care for ourselves, care for others. What kinds of community, protest and intimacy are available to those of us who are chronically in bed? Uh, and I do wanna draw attention here to Johanna Hedva's ins insistence that, quote, the most anti-capitalist protest is to care for another and to care for yourself, end quote. Lying in bed can be a form of protest, resistance and struggle potential site of revolution and creation. I wanna know where other disabled media makers and scholars and writers and colleagues are doing their work. In their home office at 8 a.m., in bed in the sweatshirt they wore all week, you know, with kids or dogs crying in the background. Like, where are we? Where do we create? How do these spaces shape our work? And what do they teach us about society, access, and illness? 
I also want to think about what are the digital spaces that we go to, right? What social media sites do we use for community connection, advocacy, and care? You know, is it Twitter? Is it TikTok? Is it YouTube? Where do we come together from MED, from our separate spaces around the globe to create and share valuable knowledge? Um, so an example of a collaborative interdependent CRIP digital knowledge production is the Twitter collective at We Are Disabled. So the tagline for this account is We Are Not a Monolith. And it's an exciting example of how international disabled communities form, have conversations, disseminate knowledge, and practice collective care through social media. So each week, a different person hosts the account and is invited to share their personal experiences, generate conversation, ask questions, and connect to other users. Um, I was a host one week in the summer of 2018 and had thoughtful conversations with people primarily in the UK, North America, and Australia about um, self-harm, self-care, allyship, white privilege, and depression. This digital disabled community challenges traditional Western understandings of authorship, right? Because rather than focusing on a single viewpoint, the account is a collective and users move through the position of host and respondent fluidly based on consent, interest, and energy. I'm interested in the kinds of knowledge being produced in the digital sphere by communities, by disabled people ourselves, connecting, disagreeing, and teaching one another about the complexities of our lives. Twitter, Discord, Slack, WhatsApp, WhatsApp Instagram, midnight phone calls, and shared Google Docs the ways we connect with each other across vast geographical distances, in our pajamas, on our cell phones. We're meeting today on Zoom during a global pandemic where chronically ill and immunocompromised people are the most at risk. We're isolating, distancing, and quarantine. We're anxious, depressed, fatigued, and in pain. We have valuable experience and insight to offer. Where do we find each other? Uh, so my, my two sort of set of questions this time are, you know, where do you work? You know, what is your, what is your space like? Um, if you feel like sharing, although we also had this really good talk about, you know, the, the problem with intimacy and sort of privacy. Uh, and then my other question will be, where do you go to connect, right? What social media sites do you use and what do you use them for? So I, I uh, and this one is um, called materiality. Right, we're taking a bit of a turn here. So uh, in this section, uh, I actually wanna focus on the physical materials of our digital devices and take a broader kind of global view of disability and digital media. Um, so what are our devices made out of? Who mines the materials? You know, what are those conditions like? Who makes our smartphones? Who benefits from the production of smartphones and who is, is harmed by them. Uh, so these questions I think are really central to the Crip Media Scholar. Uh, so Robert Mejia writes that, quote, it is well documented that the manufacturing of electronic technologies is a toxic process, end quote. He goes on to explain that users in the global north need to understand that the epidemiological consequences of technological production, usage, and disposal is most likely to harm poor women, men, and children of color. Uh, and he cites lead poisoning, the toxicity of mercury, uh, and environmental, environmental degradation caused by mining operations. Uh, in Algorithms of Oppression, which is written by Sophia Noble, she writes that in the ecosystem, Black people provide the most grueling labor for blood minerals, and they do the dangerous, toxic work of dismantling e-waste in places such as Ghana. In the price of popular media, Toby Miller describes the dangers for workers in the global south, breaking down e-waste, arguing that we need to respond to the situation by connecting the materiality of media technologies to the production of disability. Um, so some questions for us to discuss, to consider as disability media scholars, right? What are the side effects of mining? What are the side effects of working with hazardous materials? Who is most likely doing this work? Where are they located? Do they have access to protective equipment and healthcare? How does pollution, water poisoning, and environmental de degradation impact individual and community health? 
Um, so what we see developing here is a relationship between capitalism, colonialism, and disability. Right, companies in the global north use cheap labor or slave labor to mine minerals like coltan using processes that damage the land and health in the global south. Once we've used up our, uh, our technology, we ship our old computers to China or other parts of the world where workers take them apart and dispose of them and in the process are again exposed to deadly toxins. So the production of technology also produces disability disproportionately among bodies of color in the global south. Um, although not exclusively and certainly not historically when we consider the history of colonialism and slavery in North America. It's also worth noting that our media rarely talks about the harm that's committed against workers and citizens in the global south, right? Sort of all of that's very much invisibilized. Um, so I think my question for the audience, and I think we might have to do some, some Googling here is, um, what device are you using to access this lecture? I'm using my uh, Dell gaming laptop. And um, what is it made from, right? Do you know what it's made from? And where, where might these materials have come from? Would it be possible, because we're getting close to three, if people co could post their responses on the chat? Oh, that's a great idea. I'm up at thanks, the end, Ella, so I'll... we can fit all of the last section in as well. Oh, thanks, yeah. So, right, feel free to, to post and I will um, read to the next, I'll read the last section. Thanks, Ella, right. and then thanks we'll have a discussion. So okay. okay, so that section is thinking about materiality and the, the production of disability. Um, and this section, uh, we're now talking about uh, analog. Uh, so uh, I spent most of my PhD advocating for digital accesses to resources, conference and lectures on the grounds of accessibility, as well as writing against uh, you know, popular claims that, for example, social media causes depression and narcissism, um, pointing out the sexism and ableism of those claims, explaining that many disabled people rely on social media for connection and community, and arguing that social isolation is more a product of late stage capitalism and job, and job precarity than of Twitter. However, uh, now that we've all gone online during the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it's become important to clarify some of these points. For example, that Zoom meetings are not inherently more accessible than in-person meetings, right? Access means something different to every person and no one technology or format is universally accessible. The more formats we have available, the more accessible our class or space or material will be. So a purely digital format has many inaccessible features. Screen technology is almost never made for disabled users. Um, and an example is that captions are still not universally applied or necessarily done well, but are still treated as an extra or an add-on. It's always worth interrogating our media platforms and devices from an access standpoint. Who can and can't use the device? What access features are available? Are they easy to find? Are they free? There will always be a role for hard copies and physical presence for radio and letter writing. Uh, and this brings me to um, postcards. Uh, so at my thesis defense this summer, I offered to send postcards to anyone who wanted them and I was writing like um, poems on them. Several people said yes and sent me their mailing addresses. So I spent some time picking out the right postcard and then I wrote a series of like thematically related um, poems about like screens and cyborgs and coal tan mining. I've also started up a postcard correspondence with several friends across Canada, as well as some in the UK and Jamaica. There are excellent scholars who study the history of letter writing and correspondence, and I am not one of them. But it seems to me that sending physical postcards is another form of relationship and community building, a form of slow conversation and dialogue and a potential art practice. Uh, I'm interested in the kinds of analog technology and non-digital practices we use as disabled people during a pandemic to connect, communicate, advocate, and care for ourselves and each other. A couple of other examples from my personal life. I used to use the website Habitica to make lists and now I use post-it notes. I also recently bought a Polaroid camera because I was too anxious to go to the store to get my photos developed. 
Um, sometimes when I send mail, I'll add a Polaroid of my cat and it feels kind of like analog Instagram. So how do we create access offline? What tools, tech, methods, and practices do we use to care for ourselves and others during a pandemic? What is the role of analog technology in the digital age? I should also add that if anyone would like a postcard with or without a poem, feel free to send me your address. I love sending mail. Uh, and so my question for the audience or questions are, do you have any analog practices right now? And what do you use those practices for? So I think that's the end of my lecture. Uh, so uh, if we want to open it up to um, questions, uh, I'm sorry it's near the end, um, but I'm also happy to have anyone email me and get in touch if you wanna keep, keep the discussion going. <laughs>